Moon Nishiyama. Check, check, check. At Write the Docs 2014 conference, there were some mentions of Greenfield documentation. Greenfield documentation is about creating documentation and systems where none existed before. Technical writers are very fortunate if they get a chance to work in a Greenfield environment. Take a moment to give yourself a high five or a fist bump if you are working in such an environment. For other tech writers, they may have inherited a different documentation environment. The, the Environmental Protection Agency defines brownfields as property developments or redevelopments which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. I walked into a brownfield last year after becoming a tech writer at my job. Before I became an official tech writer, um, I was a support specialist at a local area university, Oregon Health and Science University, which I still work at. Um, we had an intranet support system for our internal customers. Our customers are our employees and the students of the university. They include faculty, office workers, food service workers, and anyone who needs to use their IT services in order to get their work done. We recently replaced our old antiquated Brownfield knowledge base system with a new system because, frankly, the old system turned into a piece of dew. There were a lot of issues with um, the old knowledge base system. The system's HTML editor looked like a relic from Web 1.0 days and was difficult to use. There were a lot of process issues. Prospective contributors had to watch an hour long instructional video and read three procedure documents before they were even allowed to make changes or create new accounts. The approval process for articles was a nightmare. As an individual contributor, I can go ahead and edit or create new articles, but I had to have my edits and changes approved by my supervisor, and then they're okay. I had to be approved by their managers, and then just went up the chain. Um, so a lot of times, articles never got updated in a timely manner. Many articles were written in engineer speak that was full of techno mumbo jumbo. There were no consistent formatting standards. The look and feel of those articles varied widely. So consequently, our customers lost faith in our support knowledge base over time, and our support staff lost faith in the IT department's commitment to customer service. The downward spiral of the knowledge base management led to many adverse effects. System usage declined over time. The number of calls that helped us doubled between 2009 and 2014, and with no corresponding staff increase, our support staff became stretched thin. This caused our support staff to often delay or postpone proactive higher value work, such as engineering, field work, and most importantly, writing the docs. Customers often receive different answers to common questions depending upon which staff member they talk to. Oral folklore tradition was passed on from one support staff to another, but not everyone on a team received a memo. The support staff created the shadow wiki as a stopgap. It was useful to some extent, but it had its own set of governance issues. As a member of a frontline support staff for many years, that sucked. I'm going to go ahead and give you an example of a couple of those how-to articles back in the old days. The one on the left, um, for those who can't see in the back, apologize, gonna give you a little description. It's an article about who in the organization manages our enterprise wireless systems. This was a customer-facing article. Customers who are facing, are looking for information on how to connect their personal devices to the wireless network did not get their answers questions unless they knew who to call. And then the article on the right is a how-to article on how to use the desktop phone. Cables? Really? So our old knowledge base system didn't really put user experience into consideration, and both customers and our internal staff had a different adjective for this. So, 
In April 2014, we soft launched a new help system that was integrated into our intranet. Yes, there are some of us who still use the term intranet. <laughs> we had several goals with the system. We wanted to improve the quality of experience for our customers. Also wanted to encourage experts within our IT organization to write support articles. And also, we wanted to rebuild our credibility with both our customers and with the internal IT staff. Here is a mock-up of what the new world documentation looks like, and I'll go ahead and d discuss these in detail here. Um, straight off the bat, a lot of white spaces, information that's chunked out in different areas. Um, important um, sections have a title that answers business needs. Um, title details the business need and why it's relevant to readers. The hyperlinks underneath it includes link to return to the article collection and also the important submit feedback form. The introductory how to topic section provides a brief overview of what the article is about and why it may be important to the reader and also encourages the customers in a friendly way. Um, before you start is the all important prerequisite section. I found that the use of the term before you start was less intimidating than prerequisites. This is also known as the no shit Sherlock section for the expert users. But as we heard during Alfonso and Emily's talk yesterday, spelling out the obvious is very important. The steps are chunked in the easy to follow fashion and the graphics are added when necessary. Sorry if you can't see it, but that looks like an old Nintendo screenshot that I ganked from the internet. The notes section at the very bottom includes relevant, more in-depth information for the customer, as well as links to internal and external reference pages. And a date stamp shows when the article was last updated. Yeah, April 1st, that's a joke. So what happened in our new help system after the soft launch in April and full-fledged decommissioning of the old piece of do system in July. Um, the new system, the page views, went up over time. And now we're getting about 7,000 views per month, which is great for just over 100 articles. So you might think, hey, rainbow and unicorn. And yes, that unicorn is from the cover of the first edition of Dungeon and Dragons Monster Manual. It's all nice, but it didn't happen because someone decided to wave a magic wand to transform our help system automatically. How did we get there? Well, there were some technical and tactical improvements that had to take place. Um, you've seen examples of both old crappy documents and the new world of, um, example of documents. There were some things that we didn't really have any control over, but constraints, not constraints, but things that we worked with. Um, there were part of the institution's intranet community. Um, these are the things that we needed to do. Um, we make sure that we used AP style, make, that we follow institutional specific style guidelines, and also the important thing is institutional voice and tone guidelines. And um, paraphrasing from that guidelines, and this is something I really heartily agree with, we communicate with our peers as credible colleagues. They use the information in order to perform job duties and to make best business decisions. Their pride for working for the company is impacted by the tone we use to communicate with them. And I couldn't agree more. So there, those are some of the things that we um, used as frameworks to work within. However, on, having said that, there were some things that we had greater control over. The old knowledge base system required a higher barrier to entry with watching the videos and the three mandatory articles to read before you get an account. We lowered the requirements for a new help system, so the only thing that prospect writers had to do was simply meet with the tech writer and sit through a 45-minute authoring training session, which involved um, watching a present slide presentation which detailed not only how to write the articles, but why. Why are we doing this? This was important because the support group technicians and engineers were suddenly forced to author articles as part of their job performance review. And any time that someone tells you, hey, in order to get a promotion or in order to keep your job, you need to go ahead and do X, Y, Z tasks in addition to A, B, and Z, people are going to just look at you and say, um, so trying to get their buy-in was really important. We also created a bucket list of article requests for potential authors, and those are based on customer and peer feedback. Also, 
we emphasize consistency in the formatting of articles, especially things in titles. Make sure that they're consistent in a way that they look and that they answer business needs. We wanted articles like, learn how to connect our Palm Pilot to the university's secure wireless network, or learn how to request network access for Dungeon Master's Active Directory group. We didn't want like tool specific things like preference menu overview of Clarisworks 2.0 or when to turn on SSL 1.0 on Internet Explorer 5 browser. So I edited each article after reviewing them through eyes of an end user. We focused on making sure that all steps were chunked logically, that they were understandable, they were visually appealing, and they were appropriate for business needs. I mean, it's easy to forget to document the click next to continue, or forget to direct customers to point their remote control at the console before pushing buttons. After all, it's easier to polish brass than to polish turds. <laughs> Tactical improvements are things under the hood that may not be readily visible to customers, but are still important. To help document, uh, to track our documents metadata, we created an article tracker database, which we captured the published date, the last modified date, the next review date, who the process owner or their SME groups are, list of keywords and tags associated with the article, and also change logs. We also created a standard list of tags and list of dependencies. And as part of my duty as a tech writer, I plan a weekly review of articles that are about to reach a certain age. I want to engage the subject matter experts so they can review the articles before information becomes stale. I know it's like trying to remember to send birthday cards to all 100 or 120 of my kids, but this is more important for me for upholding the credibility of the new help system. There are some things that I learned along the way. There were a lot of things in this process where there were many times during this process where I felt like I had to check my preferences at the door. I like Oxford commas. I. <laughs> I like to wear man free pants. And just like many of you, I like big words and I cannot lie. All you others writers can't deny. When a sentence goes past with the itty bitty bass and a long word in your face, you get sprung. <laughs> but I learned to leave my Oxford commas from my blogs and emails. I wear editor pants at work. And I save my predisposition for utilization of colossal rivage for other mediums such as an electronic communiques. And soft skills were very important for success of this project. Soft skills helped me build great working relationships with my customers and internal staff. At last year's Write the Docs conference, Heidi Waterhouse gave a great talk called New Sheriff in Town, which discusses many of these points in detail. Her talk has been my personal holy Bible for the past year. Having soft skills allowed me to bite my tongue during meetings with know-it-alls, <laughs> discover where the subject matter experts resided in our organization, and allowed me to respond to people's suggestions and concerns in a timely manner. I learned to learn the customs of the natives and hang out with them. I enhanced my relationships through um, with them by attending their after-hours team-building exercises events. Some of those groups have even offered cookies and adopted me. I shall remember not to lick the plates. The most important thing I learned in trying to get the buy-in of the other groups, not only for the customers but the internal staff, is addressing with them that's what's in it for me. For end users, with them is easy. With them involves making sure that the support article addresses their business needs so they can do their badass things for the company. If they cannot perform tasks because they're befuddled by technology or because the support documents are half-assed, the cost of the company is measured in lost productivity. For our peers in the IT department, with them is about creating a shared need. We need to sell a vision. We had to understand their challenges and their pain points. For my former support team that I was on before I became a tech writer, I felt their pain. 
their number of support calls to the help desk have doubled over the past five years without corresponding increase in staff. And now they're being required to create content as part of their job duties. It's as if they're forced to eat unappetizing vegetables. My goal was to win them over by building trust, showing them why it's important to embrace the new world, and also giving them friendly guides along the way so they can write the docs. And some of these tips are snippets of information that you may have heard from other talks yesterday and today, so I apologize for redundancy, but they're important stuff. We wanted to make sure that the idea of customer-friendly support documents were palatable like this wonderful vegetable dish from Dirt Candy, New York City. I did road shows for these authoring groups and impressed upon them that a future state is possible. This is a world where engineers and support staff have less time for firefighting and more time for working on greater value work. I used this example of a venerable institution that we all know as an organization that adapted to changes by going to a self-service model, the US Postal Service. Many of us remember those days of waiting in line for hours sometimes, especially around the holidays, sending out packages or buying stamps because you forgot to buy them in advance. Nowadays, most of those tasks can be accomplished by going to a self-service kiosk or do-it-yourself print labels without having to walk up to the counter. So I'm trying to use examples of that um, as a why self-service is beneficial. And working with technicians and en engineering, technical people are moved and inspired by solving problems and challenges. The last thing they want to do is spend their precious time holding end users' hands, especially when a proactive customer-facing support documentation could have prevented that in the first place. To help them uh, author articles, I created visual reference guides to encourage them. This gave them an idea of what the articles should look like, and I'll go ahead and explain these in detail here. The sections were explained in detail using the callouts on the right. I included formatting suggestions, like how to chunk sections. I also added suggestions for writing an appropriate tone for these articles. Also, I had little things like, hey, don't make your graphics wider than 550 pixels wide, and I prefer to have the articles in PNG or JPEG format. Please do not send me your all the super paint files. But having all these tools in place, it's helpful, but I learned something very important about this process. Don't expect perfection. Just because I spend eight or nine hours a day in front of these documents doesn't mean that other people possess the same adherence or aptitude to visual and content style. Would I know best coding practices after spending just a few hours learning a programming language? Don't think so. Like Karen Ronning Hall spoke yesterday, everybody forgets. My job is to encourage them and not get mad at them when they forget things, if they add Oxford commas where they shouldn't have, or if they made their pixel um, graphics 551 pixels instead of 550. Don't expect perfection and demonstrate empathy. Those are the important lessons that I learned. And the way I learned it was outside of work. In January of this year, I started taking yoga lessons. My downward facing dog looks like a passed out beached whale. My child's pose looks like that of a relaxed sloth. The yoga, instructor, the yoga instructor could have told me, child, please. And just, she could have shaken her head in disgust, but she encouraged me. She encouraged me to go ahead and just keep trying. I want to take the same approach with the contributors and express patience and encouragement along the way. There are some lessons I learned, and these are not all technical stuff, so if you're one of those technical people, this might be a great time to go grab beer. But please stick around. So as a tech writer, we learned that we are investigator reporters. Sometimes our roles involve being investigator reporters. We're asked to write support documents for systems, which we discover had been sunsetted by another group several months ago. That actually happened. One group told me, hey, we need an article on how to provision accounts for XYZ system. And then I talked to the group who supports XYZ system. It goes, oh, uh, that, we sunsetted that several months ago. 
we discover shadow wiki systems and encounter territorial wars. We walk into meetings with fellow worker bees only to discover that we walk into hornet's nest. Happens. But I learned to focus on the business needs. We're like the investigative reporters. We're not muckrackers or tabloid writers. I learned not to get sucked up on those rabbit holes of individual departments. We were hired to document processes and systems not to be done with OPPPP, which is other people's problems, politics, and propaganda. I also learned to acknowledge my weaknesses. My personal kryptonite is time management. I'm not going to make any excuses for myself, but after spending 18 years in a firefighting environment, also known as user support, I still find it hard to navigate an environment where I'm empowered to work independently and my work is measured in long-term outcomes, not the number of help desk calls I take in a day or first contact resolution or all that stuff. So I was going from being told that I could only draw, you could only drive your parents' car every Wednesday night from six to eight to an environment, hey, here's the key to the entire dealership, have fun. That's what it felt like. So time management is something that I struggle with. I want to become a more holistic, hedgehog-minded um, person like Tana Fra uh, Franco mentioned earlier. I also want to learn how to say no. When I have a lot of work that needs to be done and I say yes because I'm nice to him and because I don't want to let him down, I got to become better at that. It's, I got to become comfortable with saying to other people, I got 99 problems, but your project ain't one. This is, next topic is something that I think all of us um, could relate to. It's the imposter syndrome. Yes, Millie Vanilli. On some days, especially those days when we make mistakes, we question our fitness for the job. You feel like you're not living up to the standards. But remember, your company or client hired you because you got mad skills. You have something to offer. As Riona McNamara said earlier, have optimism and belief in yourself that you are making a difference. For me, having worked in um, user support, say 18 years, 18 years, I've been doing user support for 18 years. I have customer empathy, yo. As TED talker Amy Cuddy suggests, fake it till you become it. Yes, yeah, sometimes I go ahead and do the superwoman pose when I'm feeling down. And if anyone doubts your fitness for the job, just let them know that you're qualified. Somebody hired you for the job. You've got to channel your inner tone look and say, yo, I need 50 an hour to make you holler. I get paid to do the right thing. <laughs> Finding your support group is very important because being a tech writer can be a lonely job. Sometimes you tell the days by the number of edits that you make and at the end of the day, all you do is drink. I tap in my professional network, among other things. Meetups are great for this. Fortunately, Portland has its own chapter of Write the Docs Meetup, and Mike Jang will talk about this later, so stick around for that. I also find it important for me to always keep learning. It's, always, um, it's important to learn relevant and peripheral skills that are um, associated with my profession as a tech writer. I try to read up on topics such as leadership, human-centric business management, user interface, empathy, the latest IT trends, graphic design, service-oriented community building, and storytelling. There are so many resources for these type of things. Webinars, podcasts, books, articles, conferences, meetups, and storytelling events. Another important thing that I learned is it's very essential to take time to celebrate. Celebrate your milestones. Drink beer, treat yourself to a new book, a nice dinner, ice cream, soy latte, whatever. Take that energy, the positive energy, to the next project and article that you're working on. Sometimes when I'm feeling really silly after a milestone, I just walk in the hallway and start saying, celebrate good docs right on. It's good documentation. As painful as some days may be, it's important to remember that I'm helping curate a former brownfield environment in something new. When we started five years ago, I'm sorry, when we started 
the new help system a year ago, we had five documents in a new help system. Now we have 120. That's 120 polished documents. I've seen 10 documents and I've rocked them all. So what did Brownfield do for me? Gave me an opportunity to rebuild and curate a user support system by adopting existing conventions, adding new standards, and topping them off with plenty of patience and empathy for both our customers and internal staff. We went from having a super fun environment to something that could be super fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>